Greetings, principles of marketing people. Welcome back to the exciting, adventurous lecture series for principles of marketing. Chapter 13 of the Kotler and Armstrong Tech Retailing Asterisk and Wholesale. I added the asterisk because this. Um, lecture is going to concentrate on the retailing portion of the chapter. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't read the wholesaling part of the chapter, but I just find that uh, most undergraduate marketing students uh, have more experience in retail and, you know, more involvement in retail. I think they find it more interesting. The wholesaling portion of the text is just about three pages so you can read that uh, in no time and also there'll be a PowerPoint uh, from the authors that also covers that uh, so with that said away we go what is it you know definitions are, are I always say is a good place are good places to start with all the activities and selling goods or services directly to final consumers. We've talked about that before. You're going to buy it, you're going to use it. In a non business use, if you were going to buy it to use in a business use, you would typically buy it from a wholesaler. Right? Uh, and buy a bunch of it. Typically, or more than one, more than one pack of gum. You'd buy a pack of 500 to sell at a convenience store, something like that. So, you're going to use it personally and for a non-business use. Everyone generally knows what retailing is. The authors talk about the an early concept in retailing from Procter & Gamble, what they categorized as the first moment of truth, which were the three to seconds that you're in a store and you pause to consider product on the store shelf everybody's done that you go in there for three things and you're walking by and you go oh I didn't know they had that do I need that I might get that they bring that up to talk about our technological advancement over the last decades and to reference what uh, in the Google age which I just made that up the Google age what uh, marketers frequently call now the zero moment of truth when you start the buying process with a search on the internet and learning about products online before you even go maybe go to a retailer to lay your hands on you're already thinking about it so instead of going to the store to look and see what they have oftentimes people you know, you find things online and you may go to showroom it and buy it online, or you go, you know, I just kind of want to see that in person. Especially if it's clothing or something like that. So we can categorize or the underneath these, using these different characteristics for marketing how much service a retailer offers product lines they carry, the relative prices on their products versus other competitors, even though it's not maybe not the same product. We'll talk about that later. And how they're organized, how the retailers are organized. So service, their product lines, how long and how deep they are, pricing and organization. We'll talk about these one at a time. So, service classifications, self-service retailing, holes. You go in there and you dig through the jeans and find your size, typically. There may be somebody there to help you find your size, but not much. Not characterized as a high-service environment. Their claim to fame would be prices and a lot of different things in that price point. Limited service, Macy's, 
or a higher end retailer. You might, uh, maybe not Neiman Marcus, but uh, somebody else. Neiman Marcus might be more full service. Uh, you know, you go to Macy's, they're going to have some people that know a little something about the suits or the shirts, which in the right direction. And then we have full service retailers. My favorite men's shop. Where I like to trade is H. Stockton, and it's full service. All the way from when you walk in, you know, they'll get you an adult beverage or a Diet Coke, and my salesperson knows me and knows what I'm interested in and directs me to it, and it's full tailoring and soup to nuts, and then he'll bring it, drop it by my house on his way home one evening when it all gets ready. So those are... Uh, those are different service classifications. You can think of retailers you go to that also uh, fit into those other than these examples. I, this lecture is full of examples because I think it's easier to uh, visualize it. So we can categorize by service classifications. We can also categorize by product line classifications, specialty stores. Ulta, they carry essentially one group of goods, right? beauty aids, and typically I have been in one or two. I think generally, I know the majority, if not the 99.9%, .9%, I'm not saying there's nothing in there that I wouldn't be interested in, or males wouldn't be interested in, but that's a good example of a specialty store. They're not selling everything, they're selling a certain group of things. Department stores, Belk. You can get makeup in there, but you can also buy men's clothes and women's clothes and men's shoes and women's shoes. Uh, you can buy, uh, you know, a Cuisinart or a hot bar, uh, things like that. Those are department stores. Convenience stores, my favorite one in the whole country is Quick Trip. Uh, based out of Oklahoma, but I think Atlanta is their largest market. I'm not sure about what it used to be. Uh, I love a quick trip. Clean, well stocked, coffee's great. Uh, so we can classify retailers as convenience stores. You know other other stores, other brands that would fit into there. Super stores, like a super target, where you can buy electronics, groceries, clothing. And uh, Halloween costume, if you want to. Right, they carry many, many product lines. They don't have a deep assortment of, uh, let's say, well, that's not. They have a pretty good assortment, say, of vacuums, but they don't have a uh, as deep assortment of electronics as does Best Buy. But they have electronics. And then we have category killers. What is a category killer? I have Petco as an example. Those are superstores that have a huge, Best Buy would also be an example, that have a huge selection of, uh, they carry a product line that's both long and deep. Uh, so they're, instead of, you know, Ultas are typically much smaller than, for example, a Petco or a Best Buy. So these are super stores that are actually giant specialty stores. So like Ulta up top, but much bigger, and they have a huge amount of uh, product. Price classifications. We can classify retailers this way. These are for standard classifications, a discount store. And Walmart is my example for that. When Walmart advertises, what's their primary message that they want to convey? They have low prices on everything every day. We're going to come back to that. Off-price retailers, TJ Maxx. They typically scurry around and buy when people have overstocks or different things. So, and they don't carry the same thing all the time, but 
uh, you know, you can have some nice finds in there, whether it be artwork or blows or, or whatever. So they're not, they're off price retailers is their classification. Factory outlets. I have the Nike factory store, you know, there's a, everybody's been to a factory outlet and, uh, you know, sometimes something's, things are wrong with the product. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes I believe they're manufactured for the factory stores. Uh, or sometimes their uh, colors turned out to be not as popular as they thought they would be. And, uh, you know, different things like that. And then warehouse clubs, which are screwed up on here. Costco, and you can think of others, BJ's. And that's where you can't buy a roll of toilet paper. You can buy like 48 rolls of it if you need that much. Uh, and those are, you see this logo says Costco Wholesale. You can, it's really not pure wholesale, but more wholesale. If you were going to have a hot dog stand, you would buy your stuff there versus uh, you know, buy in the city where you're paying full retail for you know, family-sized packs of things. So that's categorizing retailers by price classification. And then we can categorize them by organizational approach. A corporate chain. Two or more outlets commonly owned and controlled. What's the benefit? Because they're so big, allows them to buy in large quantities at lower prices. Hopefully, as a consumer, they pass those prices on to you. We could call Home Depot a category killer, too. If you want to. It's a, uh, we could categorize that as a really large specialty store. Uh, and I have Home Depot up here as an example. Of course, they have more than two outlets. Uh, that's an example of a, of a corporate chain. Uh, one down the corporate chain is they buy so much. Uh, from people, um, say Rust-Oleum, Mohawk Carpet, that sometimes uh, they're the channel captain versus the manufacturer. Uh, they might tell, you know, the carpet people or the Rust-Oleum people when they want it and at what price point they want it. So that's a, that's a common problem that they must address because they buy so much, but you, would, you know, they still want to have them as customers. Uh, no doubt. A voluntary chain. Wholesale sponsored groups of independents engaging group buying and common merchandising. One that most people are familiar with are an IGA grocery store or is an IGA grocery store. If I decided I wanted to open a grocery store, I said, well, you know, I'm not going to be big enough to purchased directly from Nabisco and uh, Molson Coors and maybe even Coca-Cola, how do I compete? Well, I could join the IGA and uh, they do buy a wholesale. And so rather than Kroger that has their own distribution, uh, the IGA warehouse might distribute to uh, you know, 50 different owners that own maybe a couple of grocery stores each. And it would allow me to open a grocery store. This one happens to be in McKaysville, Georgia. But there's another one coming up on slides. I'm going to tell you that I once had a student work at. He's the only person in the class that knew what an IGA was. So that's uh, that approach, had, as opposed to corporate chains, are categorized as a referred to as voluntary chains. Retail co-ops. What's the difference down here? I have associated grocers. What's the difference between associated grocers and, and independent grocers? That's a group of independent retailers that band together and they set up and they have ownership in a warehouse operation and they can conduct joint merchandising and promotion efforts. So they have some ownership in it, whereas uh, if we have a grocery store and we're buying from IGA, 
we don't have ownership in the warehouse generally. We just are, we have an agreement with them that we'll buy wholesale from them and they'll supply our store. Associated Grocers used to operate all over the country. Associated Grocers of the South uh, is just in Louisiana now, I believe. There are other uh, groups that do that. Some were put out of business during the uh, during the big recession uh, back in the late time frame. But those are retail co-ops or cooperatives. Franchises. I think everybody probably knows what a franchise is, right? We pay a fee to somebody who has set up a business. We have a chain of businesses. And they say, we know how to open and operate these businesses. Do you want to do that? And you say, well, I hate to try to figure out how to open a fried chicken restaurant. Popeye says, no need. We have it all written out. All you have to do is pay us the fee, get started, and then the percentage of your sales each month. And we'll you call it a Popeye, and as long as you adhere to a certain set of standards and rules, uh, you can have your own restaurant without starting from scratch and coming up with a name and figuring out what kind of fryer to buy. The graphic that I have on this slide are the top five franchisors uh, in Atlanta. Uh, there's many, many more based in Atlanta, but these are the top five that are based uh, here. Arby's, Popeye's, all day in, Express, uh, Aaron's, that's the rent to own outfit, and Church's. We got two chicken. By the way, Church's chicken is excellent. The wings are super. Uh, and they, Church's is Cajun Operating Company, Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, parent company, Art Capital, Intercontinental Hotels, or IHG. By the way, it's the outfit that runs all the ends. Anyway, so franchising could be the way to go. If you want to open a shipping store, you may open a UPS store. Pay them for the luxury of not having to start from scratch and figure it all out. And, um, and then you pay them a piece of the profits every month or every quarter, and that's how they make their money. So this is a recap with four different examples. How about these examples? We're example heavy. Kroger, corporate chain. I believe Kroger's the largest grocer in the country um, out of Cincinnati. Retail co-ops, Ace Hardware. Um, most every town is Ace Hardware. I love to shop with Ace Hardware because you're shopping from an individual that owns it, but they're able to buy in bulk through a warehouse that, that uh, they have some say in. Monetary chains, the IGA and Fairmount. In case you've ever stopped by there to pick something up, pack of bologna or a six pack of Mountain Dew, uh, you've traded with an IGA. And that's an individual that opens a store on their own and banded with the IGA so they can, uh, that's their wholesaler. And then franchises. Uh, my favorite uh, franchise sub shop, Jersey Mike's. I don't know why anyone would ever buy a Subway sub if they could get a Jersey Mike's. I guess maybe they couldn't get a Jersey Mike's. If I couldn't get one, I wanted a sub, I'd just skip it. But that's just my opinion. It has nothing to do with the chapter. All right. So our ultimate goal, our retailer's ultimate goal, whatever they do, is to create value for the retail customers that you intend to target. So what goes into that? Well, we we'll to find out, you know, in our area, uh, segment, market, and then is there a target market in there that we think might be good for our business that we can target our advertising promotions to and maybe convert into a customer. Are we going to be a me too type store? Or are we going to be different? 
And if we're going to be different, how are we going to be different? And then, of course, positioning, which as we all should know by now, is the place that the firm or the product or the offering has in the consumer's mind. Right? Not what you think it is, but how they think of it. All that feeds into our uh, marketing mix, right? Product place price promotion and what products we're going to offer and what level of service that we're going to offer. If you go back to the earlier way we characterize some retailers and all that should lead to a decision that creates value or else they're not going to shop with us. So if, after you do those things, you go, I don't know that we can create value, then you probably should just stop and go home and save your money. So this graphic got all jacked up. That's a witch witch, which is a sandwich shop. I might would have included that in there as like number three in my sandwich, uh, my chain sandwich stores, but I'll stick with Jersey Mike's. Uh, retailer marketing decisions, segmentation, targeting, differentiation, positioning, just like on the previous slide. Well, the definition and profile of the market, so you can make the other decisions. If you don't uh, know what the market is, how to describe it, how to profile it, sort where people are in it, then whatever decisions you make after that, if you don't have that lined out first, you're just making decisions going blind. That's just a recap of the earlier slide. So we want to decide the product assortment. This is the L.L. Bean uh, corporate store. I don't know why that's in there. Uh, in Maine. I don't know if anybody's ever been there, but it's fun. I've been there. So product assortment at the L.L. Bean store, you would, you would think is what? They typically cater to outdoors type things, you know, camping, sailing, hunting, fishing, that type of stuff, and clothing items that revolve around that, plus some other clothing items. You can buy swimsuits and stuff in there, but uh, especially and cold weather gear. They have the bean boot uh, out front, and I've talked about that before. So they've decided that that's their product assortment. They've decided their service mix, they're not really going to be retail store heavy. They're going to be, you know, mail order and online, uh, but going to provide a lot of service. If you ever done business with L.L. Bean, it's, uh, they're very service oriented. They're not going to haggle with you about much of anything. They back everything and it's all good quality stuff. And then in this store, uh, the mothership, they may have others as well. They have a big a big tank in there where you can catch trout using their fishing rods and stuff, which is kind of fun. <laughs> and rock walls and you know, imitation creeks and streams and stuff like that. Uh, so they made those, that's their major decisions they made years ago uh, when Mr. Bean decided that uh, he was going to be involved in that business. So price. Obviously, we're going to have to decide on price. So what's it going to be? At a Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, it's going to be high markup on lower volume because they don't have a drive through At a Chick-fil-A, they're looking for lower markup on higher volume, and they do have a drive through If you make the wrong price decision, charging luxury prices for what people consider uh, convenience goods, uh, that's not going to work if you have a mismatch. Uh, at H. Stockton or at Neiman Marcus, it's going to be a high markup on lower volume. They're also going to offer high level service. At Walmart, you're going to get lower markup. They're looking to sell a bunch of it, and they're not going to offer that much service before or after the sale. If you ever try to track someone down in a Walmart, help you find something. And if you take it back, that is, they throw it on the counter, and here's your here's your credit back. They're not gonna, they don't have any skill set to say, well, here's how that thing operates, you know. If you go to Nice Hardware, bought a steel 
below her and it doesn't work, you take it back and they'll go, oh, let's look at that. They can they service the products they sell. And, you know, it's a little different. You take it back to Home Depot, you'll notice most everything you buy from Home Depot or Lowe's, it says, do not return this to the store. Contact the manufacturer. Because of the store, they can't do anything about it. They can swap it out, but that's it. They're not going to, they can't show you how to use it. Price. So are we going to have, who would you say has everyday low pricing? Just And you can say it out loud wherever you're watching this if you want to. But a bunch of people just sit out loud, Walmart. Correct. I kind of blew it earlier. Blew some of the mystery. Uh, but correct. That's the, that's their that's their key. That's what they're going for. They don't pretend to uh, do anything different. Other retailers have may have a little higher pricing, but they have sales all the time, price promotions. One place where you don't even have to have the coupons, they'll just give them to you. It's Bed Bath & Beyond. I don't know if you've ever... Maybe some of you males aren't familiar with that, but if you have a girlfriend or married, you are. Uh, and uh, you can walk in there with a lot of coupons. That's there. I don't know that anybody in my family has ever bought anything there without one. Uh, and that's kind of the way they uh, run their business. So promotion decisions. You know, product, place, price, and promotion. Within that promotion P, we have advertising. Right, personal selling. How much personal selling goes on at Walmart? Not much. If you're buying a car, quite a bit. Right? It's a more, it's a more highly involved purchase decision. This is a more complicated item, and it's more expensive. So you're more highly involved in it than you are buying a screwdriver at Walmart. Uh, sales promotion. What are we going to do there? Public relations and direct marketing. Now, direct marketing. We're going to. I think it comes up again in a minute. A lot of them are scams. So people have a bad taste in their mouth. A lot of them have been around for decades. You know, Avon and Mary Kay. That's the way they go to market. They sell direct from Avon to Mary Kay through your, you know, your local representative. They don't have they're not stores and a bunch of brick and mortar stores. Uh, that's the way they go to market. So it all depends. Uh, car dealers are heavy on advertising. You know, that's your local TV channel is full of car advertisements. So those are decisions that retailers have to make once you decide your other characteristics and variables and market segmentation and target market. How are you going to create? What's your promotion decision going to be? Where are you going to try to concentrate? What do you think would be most effective? And you would, of course, use your skills you learned in college to help you with that. The place decision for retailers. Everybody, a classic, I don't say everybody, because maybe nobody listening to this has ever heard this, but as you get older, you will. Uh, the old line is that the three most important variables in retailing are location, location, and location. And you've probably witnessed that. You've seen a restaurant or a gas station go out of business. And you go, yeah, that seemed a perfect place for that. Well, obviously it wasn't. You had to make a U-turn to get to it, or you could, it was hard to get out of, or whatever it was. People weren't looking for food when they were in that area. Just a couple of things, just a couple of items that you should know. Um, definitionally, be test questions. Book references central business districts and a shopping center. So if you think about your downtown, where you live, hopefully it's got some things down there. Uh, typically, your target's not going to be in downtown, whatever town you live in. Uh, maybe a small one, but if it's a smaller town, no. You'll probably have a bank, uh, a couple of boutiques, maybe an old movie theater that they show one in every now and then, that type of thing. Shopping center, meanwhile, you know, 
everybody knows what those are. It's where you have generally have a couple of big anchors, like a, a grocery store and a um, big box retailer. Say so you have Belk on one end and Kroger on the other, and then a bunch of other businesses. Uh, in the middle, it's managed as a unit, typically decorated for Christmas all together. Uh, Thanksgiving, same way. You know, the job center management takes care of the parking lot. Those types of things. Yeah, I don't spend too much time on what a shopping center is, but definitionally, that's what those are. So after the after the big economic meltdown with the banks and and the humans and everything else. Consumer spending tightened up. It loosened up. It's loosened up in recent years, but now with the pandemic, uh, it's growing again. But as people lose their jobs, things go out of business, uh, people are frightened about their future, are nervous about it, then people tighten up on their spending. Earlier, in the course, and I forget the student's name, it was a male, uh, talked about, uh, you know, in bad economic times, what kind of retailers flourish, and he was talking about Dollar Tree. And I didn't disagree with that, and I added another one on Big Lots. Uh, so even during bad times, uh, some retailers benefit if they're set up for it. Uh, Macy's and Neiman Marcus have not. In fact, I believe Macy's went bankrupt. Uh, you know, they're not set up for that. And a lot of people weren't set up for it, right? So once in a lifetime type thing, last one happened in 1918. So uh, those are things that, you know, especially now in light of this past year, uh, retailers are going to think about it. I read an article the other day where restaurants were – designing new restaurants to have less inside space, more outside space, and a more streamlined uh, pickup service. Whereas, say, a barbecue chain may have not had a drive through because most people came in, sat down, and ate. They say, you know, the next ones we build, we're going to be ready no matter what happens. But we want people to be able to sit outside, inside if they want to, and also we're going to have a streamlined curbside pickup or drive through uh, even nicer restaurants that you, that you were non quick service restaurant it was a pretty interesting article about how real estate tastes are changing for uh, restaurants so continuing on retailing trends and developments the rise of mega retailers superstores vertical mar marketing systems and mergers and acquisitions. Uh, Staples would be an example uh, where they bought they bought their next biggest uh, competitor. And you know, once you get to a certain size, it's hard to grow organically. You really need to grow by buying another business that is profitable. It's hard for a big business to continue organic growth. And the bigger you get, there are problems involved in that, but it also gives you buying power where you can wag the dog on what sort of price. I remember when Costco got in a fight with uh, Coca-Cola a few years back, and uh, they said, you know, we need we need to buy your products at this price point. And Coke said, well, we can't sell them to you at that price point. And Costco said, okay, well, then we're not going to carry it. And that lasted about a week. And then they came to terms. That's hard to be so. It's, it's tough to be so big that Coca-Cola needs you to distribute their products because that they're also very large. But it happens in the rise of the the mega retailers, as the authors call it. And of course, you can offer a large selection. You can run a lot of people out of business uh, unless they continue to pay their local pharmacy or. Uh, their IGA grocery store or whatever it is, and of course, information systems because they have they'll be a wash. The bigger you are, the more wash you are in information that enables you to uh, target and advertise more efficiently. So, non-store retailing, we've got 
direct retailing, direct selling. Uh, there's an organization just for direct sellers. I mentioned Avon, Mary Kay, and you can probably think of others. Online, of course. Everybody's bought something mobile using a mobile device. And on social media, you can buy directly off of Instagram uh, or Facebook or Facebook Marketplace. Think about how it's changed the garage sale days. And those are only going to get these are only going to get larger and uh, grow even more. Uh, it's the reason you saw Walmart recently uh, decided to start their Walmart Plus to try to compete with Amazon Prime because it was uh, it was cutting into them. So uh, I don't know how that's going to work because they don't. There's not the volume of you can't get the volume of goods off of Walmart Plus that you can off of Amazon Prime. But they do have a lot of stuff. So uh, we'll see how that works. Retail technology. Technology just changes, has changed everything, continues to be a great disruptor and a great help. Uh, you know, you used to have to, when I was working in a grocery store, you know, you had to get a count on the ketchup bottles, the Heinz ketchup, the Hunts. You should never eat Hunts. Store brand, whatever, so, they, so the manager could place their order. Now it's all electronic. They just set the order points. When we get down to whatever, 30 bottles of Heinz ketchup in the 16-ounce bottle, and the system automatically, you know, automatically orders and it knows in real time. Just a simple example, but um, and allows them to get it in just in time, so it's not sitting around in the warehouse or in the stock room in the back where people can steal it or run a forklift into it or Bobby can knock it over and break it. Um, and it's just streamlined a lot of stuff. So, you know, technology has really helped retailers during what was turning into a really tough time but I think for the most part uh, there'll be some shakeout during the pan the COVID-19 pandemic but uh, not as bad as it could have been and once consumers start spending again that will be very helpful and uh, one last trend green retailing I've mentioned it before and we've talked about it on the uh, back back that it's much easier to offer a sustainable or green product to the marketplace or open a sustainable uh, green car wash versus one that just dumps the water out into the road and <clears throat> various other things. I have this green wise uh, picture up here. I can't remember if I took that or not, but uh, when my daughter was going to grad school in uh, Tallahassee uh, at Florida State, uh, half the time she would call me, her and her cronies would be up here uh, because in the top of the green lines they had a student lounge where you could sit up there and get on the Wi-Fi and uh, work, study, and of course it was smart from a uh, public perspective because when they got hungry, what did they do? They just went downstairs. Uh, to the deli or whatever, got something to eat, went back upstairs, continue on about whatever they were doing, uh, the studying and writing, whatever they were doing. So I just opened one up in East Cobb here, uh, but you'll notice it really doesn't say Publix on it anywhere. It's just called Greenwise, and uh, it's, it's their version of a environmentally sustainable store from top to bottom. They remind you when you go in there, you know, of all the things that they're doing that uh, creates hardly any waste and they have all uh, you know the materials in there didn't ship very far and they're all organic and whatever so it's just that it's just if you greened a whole grocery store uh, that's it and Publix is calling them green wise and you may have been in one of these I don't know there aren't that many uh, but it was a very smart concept on there especially the one in Tallahassee so I believe we'll see more of those in the future uh, because, you know, people don't feel bad about shopping in them. Okay, so that is the lecture for Chapter 13. And uh, I hope you watched it all. And if you didn't, you need to.
nice to people out there. Wash your hands. I'll see you back on the internet.